All right, just a welcome again to everybody who's come here uh, to hear Mark and Norman and their book launch. Um, just a little bit of an introduction, and I'm just so excited to uh, welcome both of them. Um, first of all, I just want to welcome Mark. Mark is a friend of Hazelnut. Um, he's been a real advocate for us right from the beginning. He's, uh, he's an American, so that's just exciting. I mean, we really like that. But he lives in Wales, and he's a, uh, he's a canon of Brecon Cathedral. Um, and he also runs Convivium, which is a really exciting uh, program coming up. And I want him to tell you more about that later. And it's a joy to have him as Mark is a real advocate and a, and a great friend. And his books are amazing, lots on walking. So please do check those out on hiking and spirituality. Also, just want to uh, excited again to welcome Norman. Um, Norman has been an inspiration um, for Hazelnut. Uh, many of his writings have really drawn deep into kind of the theology that's formed us as a community. And I think um, I would say that I say that only to say that I think there's a lot of communities around UK and America that have been uh, impacted by the wisdom of Norman. Norman. I think uh, the beauty of it is, is that he draws together the beauty of theology and the beauty of nature together and links them and creates um, strong bridges for those um, places for us to be able to reside and make those links. So it is a great joy to have him with you. So really, thanks so much for coming, Mark and Norman. And um, I'm going to get out of the way now and hand it over to Mark. Well, thank you all for coming. It's good to see so many people who have nothing else to do on a uh, on a on a, an evening, or if you're coming from America in the afternoon, um, especially clergy. It shows that yes, we don't indeed ever work. Um, uh, it, 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 it's a pleasure to be able to uh, to talk to you all about what inspired my my book and hopefully what might uh, inspire you, um, whether you read the book or just listen to what I have to say this evening, or perhaps what I say this evening will inspire you in the opposite direction. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, the... <laughs> My book has an interesting um, germination. So I have for years been what I like to think of as someone who's a passionate walker. Other people call me a mad walker. Uh, I am nearing after uh, 10 years of kind of dedicated walking, uh, I'm nearing about 22, 23,000 miles uh, that I've covered in the past 10 years. So I'm, I'm, I'm planning a big party when I, I cross that distance that is the equivalent of the circumference of the, uh, of the planet. Uh, and, you know, for, for ages, I was reading probably many of the same books that Norman read, uh, you know, be it uh, Robert McFarlane or um, um, uh, Wendell Berry, of course, or uh, any of the greats. Uh, and greatly inspired by them, but I quickly realized that I had none of the ability such people have. I'm a, at best, mediocre gardener, uh, never farmed in my life, but the one thing I realized I could do was put one foot in front of the other. Uh, and after 10 years of walking an average of about seven miles a day, I've gotten pretty darn good at putting one foot in front of the other though my joints disagree with that. Uh, and so that was kind of lurking in the background. Plus I had written a several books on Augustine and on consumerism. And my mother kept saying to me, when are you gonna write a book that somebody wants to read? So uh, that was all bubbling in the background in my mind in 2015, when I was in a difficult time in my life. Uh, both professionally and in my domestic life. And that autumn, I decided I was going to escape the, um, the, 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 the pressures of autumn term, and I would get out to a mountain, which will be familiar to people in the UK and the US, you probably will never have heard of it, called Kader Idris. And Kadir Idris is the southernmost mountain in the Snowdonia mountain range. The book is called A Pilgrimage, but I certainly didn't go on this walk thinking I was making a pilgrimage. I just thought I would pack up my, my rucksack 
and spend uh, a night on the mountain and just get away from everything. Uh, and sure enough, that's what happened. I went on this walk. In many ways, it wasn't any different from other short treks I had done. In some ways, it wasn't nearly as spectacular as some of the other treks I'd done, whether it was in Iceland or Norway at that point, or later on in the Pyrenees, uh, the Alps, or, um, or, or in the south of France. Uh, and, and not even among the best ones I've done in Wales. And yet, I think it was the season of my life and, uh, and the realization that I was about to move away from Wales uh, with no inkling that I would be returning, that when I got back, I found reflections bubbling out of me. Uh, and it's, you know, we've all had this experience before where we don't realize how much we love something until we're about to lose it. Uh, and it was at that moment as I was driving back from a spectacular overnight on Cateridris that I realized how much I had fallen in love with Wales, despite the weather. That was a fortunate thing that it bubbled up in me because I'd been asked to write an essay for uh, an American online journal called the, the Living Church, the Covenant is the, um, is the online part of it. And so I, I sat down and, and it just poured out on the paper an essay where I didn't even realize it at the time, but on reflection, I realized that I had learned something central to at least my faith. Didn't know if it was anybody else's faith, but my faith in that overnight trek on Kader Idris. And it tied into all my other walks in Wales. In essence, the landscape had taught me something. And what it had taught me initially, when I began to reflect on it, was two primary paradoxes. The first was that I had begun, well, well, the first was the night where I had pitched my tent, I was sitting in the bowl of Kader Idris. Kader Idris means the chair of Idris. Uh, and it's because uh, there's a great big bowl um, around which the heights uh, surround. So it looks like, from a distance, a bloody great chair. And that's where the giant Ildris is said in legends to have placed his posterior. Uh, but sitting in that bowl, it was as though time meant nothing. From a certain perspective, yeah, it's all been change over the millennia, but I could have come there 200 years ago, and if we haven't destroyed the planet, I could come back in 200 years and it would be the same landscape. So there was this sense of changelessness. And that struck me powerfully because I had begun the day in a valley just to the west of Kader Idris that was drenched with history. And so I was really struck by this paradox of the changeless being set in the deeply historic landscape of that part of Wales, where there's been human habitation for 20,000 years and visible human habitation over about 8,000 years. Uh, and so I, I thought it's an interesting paradox there because they're not in conflict with each other. It's though that deep human history and the changeless landscape were made for each other. So that was the first paradox that struck me. The second one was that in the night, during the night, during the evening, while I was sitting by my tent, it was absolutely silent. And if you've ever been in a mountain landscape at night, mountains have their own powerful, awesome silence. Uh, and I was just enjoying the silence within the cavern of that bowl of what's called Kum Kai, it was as though there was no humans anywhere, where there was no noise other than the sound of the wind and the, and the sheep going yeah all the time. And yet, that silent mountain has been the source of words for millennia, be it mythology, be it folklore, be it the lives of saints, 
be it just people who have gone up cash register and come back down and bragging about it or complaining about the blisters they got. So there was a second paradox that the silent landscape was the inspiration of generations upon generations of, of, of words. The, the third paradox, which I only began to explore as I began to write the book and to turn that initial essay into a book, was in some ways the most obvious. And that was, first of all, wonder, the wonder I experienced when I went to the top, Penagadaya, and I could see over the Irish Sea towards Ireland and, and the beautiful mountains all around me, uh, filled me with absolute delight as, as mountaintops ever do. And yet it struck me that everything within my vision was basically the old four elements of fire, water, earth, and, 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 and air. Um, there was no, there was nothing really there that was artificial. Everything I could see was as common as muck, as they might say in the North. Uh, and yet they were arranged in such a way that inspired me, filled me with, with wonder. And so I began to explore those paradoxes. The original title of the book, which nobody but me liked, was Paradoxes in a Mountain Landscape. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the more I thought about those paradoxes, the more I thought it really took me to the heart of my Catholic faith, or my sacramental faith, you might say. Uh, where we encounter this paradox of heaven and earth coming together, God and man coming together uh, without one uh, overwhelming the other. Uh, and, and so in the writing of this book, I, I, I argue uh, through my own relation of that overnight encounter on uh, experience on Kadir Idris, what I, I like to think of as the nuptial mission of, of Christianity of saying to, uh, to all who want to separate spirit and matter, um, uh, heaven and earth, God and man, to say that which God has brought together, let no one put asunder. Uh, and so that was the, the genesis and the sweep of the book, which ended up being partly a love letter to Wales, partly uh, a theological reflection on these, these paradoxes that I encountered, partly uh, a very personal memoir of uh, a, a year of my life, um, and, uh, and then partly just uh, an exp a, a, a kind of travel story. And I hope they all weave together in a way that's both engaging, but also will get people, especially people who are passionate about the preservation of the, of the environment, of our local landscapes, that to recognize not only the spiritual dimension, but, but also um, the importance of heritage, how humans have inhabited that landscape, not just in the present, but, but, but over the centuries and in places, the millennia. All right, Norman, over to you. <laughs> All right. Well, first of all, thanks so much too for, for coming to this evening's uh, presentations. And I hope that we'll have some good conversation because as an author, one of the things I most like to do is to talk with people about their concerns and questions and how the work I do might be able to intersect with those questions and concerns. So I thought I'd start by saying a little bit about, about how I come to do the work that I do. I'm a Canadian, grew up farming in Western Canada, thought I was going to be a farmer but for a lot of reasons, that was not going to be an option because farming is an enormously difficult thing to do and financially almost impossible to do given today's uh, agricultural system. So I went off to school thinking I'd be a teacher and ended up studying theology and ended up studying up philosophy, did a PhD in French and German philosophy. And in all that time, never read a single farmer. And of course, while I was in the middle of that education, uh, it didn't seem to be a big deal. I mean, I grew up with farmers, but I didn't think that farmers should be writing books, and I didn't think that farmers should be engaging big philosophical questions. That's what ac academicians do. And then uh, I've been teaching for a good number of years and had moved to Kentucky, and 
while I was there, I asked a, a Kentucky native, I said, who's a Kentucky writer that I should read? And they said, well, I think you should read Wendell Berry. You might like him. I had never heard of Wendell Berry, even though I had been reading some environmental philosophy. And um, I read the first book, selection of essays, and I read some of his short stories, and I really liked them. And then I read a book of his called The Unsettling of America. And it's a book that hit me between the eyes because it was the story of my family, just set a little bit differently in time because I saw played out in the farming community that raised me, the conflict that Wendell describes as a conflict between industrial ways of production and traditional husbandry ways of growing food, raising animals. And I thought, well, this is, this is really remarkable. And if you've read Wendell's work, you know that he's a, first of all, he's a beautiful writer, but also a really powerful thinker about many of life's and culture's biggest questions. And so I just started reading like crazy. But I had heard that he may not want to talk to academicians. He's somewhat suspicious of academicians. So I wrote him a, a letter saying, you know, would you ever let me come out and visit you? Because I really love your work. I have farming background, so I resonate with a lot of what you're doing. And I'd love to just chat with you. And he was really gracious and invited me to come out and spend an afternoon. And we did that. And we really hit it off. And we became friends and started to, to work together. And the reason I mention this is because this was my second major education, right? So I had college and graduate school and divinity school. But it was Wendell introducing me to a whole history of agrarian writers, starting with Hebrew prophets, Amos and Hosea in particular, but then also agrarian writers from around the world. And what, what he helped me see is that agricultural peoples are profound sites of insight for life's biggest questions because agricultural people are the, precisely the folks who are constantly navigating the sources of our own livelihood whether in the forms of food, whether in the forms of energy, textiles, timber, whatever we need to build a home in the full meaning of that term. And as I was reading all these agrarians, it, it struck me that not once in divinity school or not once in graduate school did I see the perspective of farmers represented in the great texts of these traditions. Now I would later learn that that's not entirely true, they can be in these traditions, but you have to know how to look for them. So I decided that it would be time for me to maybe start writing in a different key, which is to say as an agrarian. And by an agrarian, what I mean is somebody who wants to advocate for the health and vitality of land and people together. And the crucial term here is together, because we've had lots of people advocating for the health of, of people reconciliation of people, harmonious relationships among people. Not always to full effect, but that's certainly been on the agenda for a lot of people. But we've also at the same time in the pursuit of flourishing human communities, degraded the land upon which all human communities depend. And that has not received as much attention. And so I wanted to think about, well, how, how would we think differently if we made the land and the communities of life it supports as the foundation from which all of our subsequent thinking was going to proceed. And I realized that it was an enormous question because it's not as though you start with all the questions that we have about traditional philosophy, theology, and then just say, well, we'll just tack land onto the end as one more issue that we'll take up. What I discovered is that if you take the land seriously as not territory, but as the, the place of life, you suddenly have to ask the questions differently. The metrics by which you decide whether you have a good answer change dramatically. And so I began this process of trying to rethink basic philosophical and theological categories. And, and the first place I went to was really the, the doctrine of creation. I had studied creation theology in, in divinity school. And it was really good stuff, but it was so closely tied to the metaphysics of origins. Right? How did the world begin? How do we make sense of beginnings? And those are important questions, but I began to realize that this is not how scripture speaks about creation that much because scripture 
was written by intelligent people who realized no one was there at the beginning because the whole point is to talk about the conditions for the possibility of any beginning at all. So it's not a journalistic account that's going to tell us what it was like at the very beginning. And I, I decided that the much better way to talk about it is that creation as it registers in scripture is trying to help us understand the meaning and significance of everything that is. And once you begin with that assumption about what creation means, suddenly a whole set of other questions emerge. Questions not just about, you know, is the world beautiful? Do we protect it? But it's the place where God dwells. It's the place where God's love, as I say, is not simply directed, but it's the place where God's love is made materially manifest. It's the place where God's love becomes visible, fragrant, auditory, delicious, and tactile. That changes everything because now we have to think about not just soil, water systems, plant life, animal life, human life, as, as enfolded within the love of God, but as the manifestations of that love. So I started working on those sorts of themes and I realized that this is also then going to have profound implications for how we think about what it means to be a human being. Because if the world is creation and human beings are made by God, created by God, sustained by God, loved and held into their being by God, that ought to change the way we think about what it means to be human. And so I thought I need to develop this in terms of an account of human creatureliness. Philosophers have given lots of ways to describe what a human being is. You know some of these, we're the rational animal, we are the linguistic animal, we are subjects, we're autonomous beings, we're self-legislating, we're doing all kinds of ways to describe ourselves. But not, the, not many theologians have really tried to articulate what it means to say that human beings are creatures. What difference does that make? So that was the second question that I really wanted to pursue in some detail. And then the third one was, well, if the place where we are is God's creation, and if who we are is God's creature, what are we supposed to do? And it's a, you know, it's a long-standing question, but what I realized as I was reading is that uh, not too many philosophers or theologians thought this question in terms of the two framings of world as creation, humans as creatures. And so I thought that the best way to describe what human beings are supposed to do in this world is through the lens of creativity. And I wanted to be very quick to say that creativity doesn't mean what sometimes people think it does, which is to be that tortured individual genius who labors away in obscurity, tortured and trying to give expression to themselves and their inner torment and what have you. I know that's a caricature, but it's the kind of caricature that has had some profound influence because so many people, when you ask them, are you a creative individual? They will say, well, no, I'm not really, I just work. And I wanted to say, but isn't work an exercise in creativity? Isn't making a meal an exercise in creativity? Isn't raising children an exercise in creativity? And so I wanted to give a, a description of what creativity means in the very broad sense of the term so that everybody understands themselves as creative participants in God's unfolding of a world. In other words, creativity is you figuring out how to take the love that is embedded, made material in you, figuring out how to take that love and join it with the love that's always at work in the world. And in your participation, learning how to add beauty and goodness, and as I will also add, hospitality to the world in which we live. And so the book became an exercise in trying to understand how the logics of creation, creatureliness, and creativity hang together in really, really important ways. Because my concern is that theologians, and philosophers too, but in this case specifically theologians, Theologians have not been doing a very good job articulating this logic and not done a very good job trying to influence the political economies that we know are doing so much damage to the earth. I start this sacred life with an analysis of what's happening to our planet and what's happening to humanity. And in both of them, 
what we discover is a profound discontent with the world as given and a profound dissatisfaction with human life as given. And a lot of it has to do with our refusal to accept our finitude, our limited character, our vulnerabilities, our need for each other, our need for land. And so I was hoping that this logic of creation, creatureliness, and creativity might show forth a path in which we can imagine this world as beautiful and good, human beings as all sacred beings, all cherished and loved by God, and work as an expression of our devotion to God and as an honoring of the sanctity of this world and the sanctity of all its life. Because as you know, the world's in rough shape, human communities are in rough shape, and we need healing. And, and I wanted to see what, what can we draw on from theology and philosophy, cultural studies that might put us in a better position to become participants in God's nurture of this world and God's healing of this world. So that's what this sacred life is about. And I think we can now open it up for Q and A and conversation. Brilliant, thank you so much. And Norman, you slightly answered my first question at the end there. Um, my first very basic question for both of you is what's your book called and where can we get it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, you know what's really sad? I, 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 I'm okay. actually in Oxford right now, so I'm not home. <laughs> and instead of bringing a copy of my book, I brought a copy of this. <laughs> hey! What's with that, each other. Oh, That's here we crazy. go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had your book on my desk a little while. Yeah, yeah, right, Mark. Oh, no, I do. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Here we are. Oh, lovely. That's a good screenshot there for the video. <laughs> Wonderful. That's perfect. Uh, I'm sure both sold at all good booksellers um, and try and avoid Amazon. That's probably yeah, that's, yeah. especially at, at any good independent bookseller. Definitely. There we go. Wonderful. We will send links in, in the follow-up email from this um, event as well, if anyone wants links. That's great. Or maybe Jonathan can put them in the chat. We'll try and do that during the session. So fabulous. Great. Um, so the first question we've got here in the chat is from Pippa, which is a very interesting one. Um, do you think we can deprivatize land and ever return to the commons? Nice niche question there, Pippa. Either of you got a response to that? I'll let you take that one, Norman. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's an enormously complicated question because right now we're in the middle of a global land grab, which is really unsettling. It's not just that, you know, we've seen histories of privatization of land in the UK, in America, Canada, but we're now seeing that there are many countries in the world that are very, very concerned about whether or not they're going to have fertile soil upon which to grow food and also water, right? Water is becoming a, a, a huge issue because if you have soil, but it's not well watered, you can't grow certain kinds of crops, especially those that are very water hungry, water thirsty land. And so very wealthy nations, very wealthy corporations are buying up, you know, prime agricultural lands in Africa, South America, uh, all over the place. And this has been, of course, a disaster for people who have been small landholders historically. Uh, so that, that's a big problem. A another dimension to this, which doesn't often get talked about, is that there are trade agreements that, you know, the global trade agreements that are made between different nations. And oftentimes these trade agreements require sort of what we might call a neoliberal economic order in which the primary job of the country is to figure out how to raise the commodities, produce the commodities, that will help pay down the debt. And that again has meant that all sorts of small landholders have been forcibly removed from their lands. And these lands have then been converted into large industrial enterprises in which the production of commodities sometimes simply roses. So people in North America can have roses for Valentine's Day. And so in many parts of the world, we're now seeing that you know, people are losing access to land. Pricing of land no longer bears any relation to its production possibilities. Land is now an investment. I mean, this is why I didn't go into farming in the 1980s. The land that I could have thought about buying was so expensive already then 
that if I farmed it for my entire life, I would never pay down the debt. And since then, the, co the, the costs of land have, you know, increased several thousand percent, all right? Thousand percent. So the news around agricultural lands is not very encouraging. So one of the things I tell people is this needs to be something people are educated about. It needs to be something that especially church people need to be educated about. Because not just church people, but other communities of faith, many of them sit on land, right? The Catholic Church, the Church of England, Church of Sweden. These are all churches that have tremendous amounts of land. Some of this land is being used for industrial production. And the question would be, why can't some of these lands be turned to food production? Uh, this would be an enormous gift. And there are lots of younger people in particular who want to farm. So my argument would be that let's try to get some of these lands that we can make available, that can be turned into a commons, because we have all the theological reason to do so. Why don't we start there? And maybe that will be a witness to other people who will then realize that this needs to be broadened beyond communities of faith. That's fantastic. Thank you. All, all I would, all I would add, and I'm, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm just good at walking, not, not much else. Um, but I think it, I think it points to a broader issue, and I, I often compare our position to the Protestant reformers who longed to recreate the church of the of the earliest age, the, the, the primitive church, as they would have called it. Uh, and so Luther and Calvin, for example, in their, um, in their works were not just trying to reform the church, but they were trying to return it to what they understood to be a pristine moment in the life of the church. Uh, and yet they were every inch late medieval, early modern theologians and their imaginations and their modes of thinking and their expectations were all shaped by the world in which they actually found themselves. And, and so no matter how much they tried to recreate the primitive church, they ended up uh, poor things by being either Lutheran or, 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 or Calvinist rather than Anglican. Um, and, and we're in a similar position, even as we try to imagine and, and I think, I mean, one of the things that troubles me a, a little bit about uh, the, our, our current strivings and yearnings for a more ecological existence um, is, is that we haven't even begun to entertain the, the just deep lifestyle and social changes that this is going to require. We still want to hold on to that cornucopia offered by technology, which got us into the mess in the first place. But but we, we are people whose imaginations, whose experiences, whose expectations have been deeply, deeply formed by the consumer cultures in which we, we live. And so even while we try to imagine what a different world might be like, before we've even begun to think of it, our, 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 our thought patterns have been compromised. Um, and so we, I think we have to start off in that position of, of humility, um, recognizing that even as we strive, in some ways, we're getting it completely wrong because we have unarticulated red lines um, that, that keep us from fully imagining the kind of world that perhaps God created and redeemed us to inhabit. That's brilliant. Thank you both. That was really, really rich answers there. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in and they are um, all very, uh, very in depth and wonderful. So I'm trying to figure out a good flow in conversation mm -hmm. here. Um, maybe if we jump to this one for Mark, um, I might jump a little bit off the back of what you were just saying. Um, how can or should we relate the emphasis on pilgrimage in such thinkers as Augustine with agrarian emphases upon becoming native to one's place? So that's probably for both of you, actually. I can imagine Norman has something to say on that as well. Um, but Mark, would you like to jump in first? Yeah, that's an excellent question, because uh, um, uh, with all due respect to, uh, to Jeff, who was among us, who, who actually won the prize for to come up with a better title than the one I did for my book, 
I was a, I was a little resistant to the term pilgrimage. One, it, it's kind of overdone these days, but but it it seemed to run against the thrust of my book, which is how do we inhabit the places where we are? The one suggests movement, and the other suggests staying put. Uh, I, I was won over to it because of the uh, charitably put the anomaly of my argument uh, that's, that's contained in my argument. You could say less charitably that I'm just a damn hip hypocrite. And that's the fact that while I, you know, home is such a powerful image, I think, in my book uh, and, and, and really inhabiting, really loving the places where we live. But I write this as a person who's lived in 30 different places. Uh, that's taken me up and down the Eastern American seaboard and, and all over the UK. Uh, uh, I'm coming up to five years here in Brecon, and that's about the longest I've lived anywhere since I was 10. Um, so, um, but, but at the same time, I, I, without excusing my life, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I think the fact that I've moved a lot and I like to walk a lot, probably means I am a bit more of that kind of restless explorer that Wendell Berry doesn't really care much for. Uh, and I'll keep that to myself when I meet him in the autumn. But um, I think there is something about a pilgrimage that, that causes one to take notice and be attentive. You know, obviously you're going to be take notice of and be attentive to the shrine, the, the destination. But if you've read your Canterbury Tales or if you've read any pilgrim account, the journey itself is, as it were, uh, where, where God is encountered as much as, if not more than the, than the shrine. And so what I like to think of in my book is, is, is a way of walking, of taking the time to move slowly through a landscape, is a way of recognizing and being attentive to that landscape, which after all is that part of, of the whole uh, realm of creation that you have the possibility of tasting and, and seeing and hearing and everything else uh, at that moment. Um, and I like, well, I like to think, I know actually that my years of walking have opened my eyes and my ears and my all my senses to my environment in ways that it never was before. Uh, and so in that way, uh, it becomes a pilgrimage of inhabiting, you might say. Another paradox, be my next book. <laughs> Fantastic. Norman, do you have anything to add to that or? No, I'm, I, I, li I like what Mark was up to there. Wonderful. It was a beautiful answer. Um, and again, just, this, this is probably again, for both of you, but um, I think it builds on what Mark was saying there. This question from James, how does what you discovered about creativity differ from the American romanticist sense of creativity or other notions and traditions on creation? Mm. Well, I, I think I'd be interested to know which American romantic thinker you're, you're you're wanting to point to because there's some differences among them. But you know, I think the the image I want to bring into people's minds and really into their hearts is the better way to put it, because creativity is not simply a cognitive exercise. It's something that registers at a deeply affective, embodied level. Is to get away from the notion that what we do with creativity is start with an idea in our heads that we then impose upon the world. What instead we do when we're engaged in creativity is we come into the presence of where we are and who we are with, so as to try to better understand the potential that is latent within them, and then work with what we encounter so that something beautiful can emerge. And so rather than it being an imposition of our thoughts and ideas and ambitions upon the world, creativity becomes a kind of submission to a world in which you learn to develop the skills to become someone who works with the world to produce yet what was not there before. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I mean, the, the kinds of things I like to do, I mean, I, I like to garden, I like to cook food, but I also like to build things out of wood. 
furniture and small buildings. And I, I used to build houses too. But if you've worked with wood, you know that there's something utterly beautiful about the medium that you come into the presence of what the wood will allow. And it takes a while because you have to know, you know, how wood works, how it feels, how it cuts, how it stains, how it finishes. But when you work with it in a way that's sympathetic to the wood, something can emerge. Now, obviously, the beauty of the product depends upon the skill that you have. So if you don't have much skill, it's not going to be that great. But a very similar thing happens in a kitchen, right? Who would have thought that putting together some apples and some flour and some butter could produce an apple pie? I mean, that's an exercise in which people over a long period of time realized that there is potential in this thing called an apple that when treated in a particular sort of way and combined with flour, which begins, of course, as wheat, when treated a certain sort of way will produce something this delicious. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at when I talk about creativity. I, I, my worry is that we're walking through the world oblivious to the world that we're in, not noticing its potential, not noticing its beauties. And it's not just the natural places, it's the people we're with. Right? How can we learn to be creative with each other so that we so come into the presence of each other as people that we see in them potential that they don't even see in themselves so that they in the realization of the gifts that are uniquely theirs, they can become the most beautiful people imaginable. Because beauty, one of the ways to describe it is not just pretty, obviously that's a pretty crass way to talk about beauty, but one way to think about beauty is to see how in each creature, how in each place, the fullness of the particular life, right? And it's going to be different for every creature. What that can look like, what it can feel like, what it can sound like when it's being realized. And that needs help. It needs nurture. It needs coming alongside. And so that's part of what I'm trying to get at with creativity. Yeah, let me. Uh, I was going to try and find real quickly. I, I I will not add my own two bits. I will uh, because I always have to bring Augustine in somewhere. Um, I'll just read a bit from Augustine that I think resonates with this. Um, and he's talking about Adam and Eve. And this is in his um, his work on his commentary on Genesis, um, where he has his vision of what life would have been like for for Adam and Eve. Uh, and unsurprisingly, he pictures them as kind of um, uh, Roman uh, farmers. Uh, and it's a, just a, a wonderful, wonderful um, image that I think resonates. And it says, uh, you see, there was no distress of wearisome toil by pure exhilaration of spirit when things which God created flourished in more luxuriant abundance with the help of human work. As a result, the creator himself would be praised more copiously for having, having given a soul set in an animal body, the rational faculty of working as much as would satisfy its willing spirit, not as much as it would be reluctantly forced to do by the wants of the body. Uh, and so he has this, this wonderful image of all things being equal. You know, leaving aside this pesky little thing we call the fall, that um, that we were we were created to to join in God's creative activity, uh, and when we join in that creative activity, which is the exact same thing as sharing in God's own delight in His creation, then that resonance gives us a sense of completion. Some people might say Sabbath even. <laughs> Wonderful. I think, Mark, you've done a really good job there of linking on to the next question. Um, and I think, to be honest, both of you have sort of answered the first part of this question in a way, although you might want to comment a little bit more on it. Um, the first part of the question is, how do we interpret the dominion of Genesis 126 in ways that don't fudge, is the word used, the full breadth of that Hebrew verb? And, then, and I think you kind of captured the spirit of that a little bit already, but maybe you want to unpack that a little bit more. But the second part of the question, I think is very interesting. How do we apply this to contemporary, largely urban life? 
yeah, the urban life part of it is is one of the things I I I struggle with the most, and I I get questioned about that a lot, uh, and and I'm forced to recognize, at least in terms of my book and my perspective, uh, I uh, I benefit from the fact that I'm I'm in a rural part of the world. Uh, you, I'd, I'd probably rather be shot than live in a place like London. Um, don't take me up on that. But um, uh, and, and one of the things I'm currently working well on when I have the chance to do it is exploring more the whole issue of, of cities uh, and the fact that cities are now growing uh, as quickly as they are, we've gone from just a few mega cities to over 35 now or something like that in the world. Uh, and, and of course, the whole economy that then is required to sustain these, these cities. I mean, pretty much, we're, if we're not there already, we're approaching it where the vast majority of the planet is, is given over towards supporting our, our urban civilization. Um, but in terms of dominion, I always think, you know, I, I'm no Hebrew scholar, so this probably doesn't work, but, but we do need to make a distinction between dominion and domination. Uh, and, and the dominion that we're given is the kind of dominion uh, that we encounter in some of Jesus's parables. Um, that is a dominion that's much more like, and I know this term has become uh, controversial as well, but is much more like stewardship. We, we are not the master ourselves, but are exercising uh, our, our image bearing uh, priesthood. Uh, and, and, I, and I think we are portrayed, or at least Adam and Eve are portrayed as the priests of the Holy of Holies of creation, which is, which is Eden. Uh, uh, in a way that is under the eye of the master uh, who may come at any time. To, uh, to, to say how we've been doing uh, and, 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 and woe betide us. But, um, but at the same time, I personally, I'd be interested to hear what Norman has to say. I'm personally uncomfortable with people who want to be more dismissive of terms like stewardship. Um, I think we have to recognize that we human beings have a special power within creation but but over the creatures around us to their detriment, as we're seeing right now, um, or hopefully to our harmonious coexistence. Um, and uh, and and it does no good for us to pretend that we haven't we don't have that power, um, even if uh, it is a power that we uh, have consistently abused. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I think I, I would want to make two historical points. One is we have to ask about the context in which the word dominion is being spoken or heard or read, because the word dominion can mean something very different in a post-industrial mechanical, you know, nuclear bomb mechanical age, because we think about power in such fundamentally new ways, right? We now have the power, literally, to blow up the planet, to terraform the planet, to even contemplate terraforming other planets. This is, this is a power that would have been unimaginable to people of scripture's time. And we have to remember that these are people who are either agrarian people themselves, farmers, shepherds, or they are closely tied to people who are. And so these are folks who live within a, a world in which the power of human beings was recognized to be so much smaller and fickle and fragile when compared to the enormous powers of the natural created world. So that just needs to be borne in mind because we read it from a, you know, a 21st century perspective where human beings have tremendous power. And then I think the point needs to be made that if, if this power is made to reflect the image of God, we understand from reading scripture that God's power is not ever coercive. And this makes perfect sense, not only theologically, because the God we serve is a non-coercive, non-controlling, but a canonic self-offering God, as, as shown in the life of Jesus. But then we also see that this power makes agricultural sense, right? If you're a farmer, if you think you're gonna just control your field through ruthless exploitation, it won't take you very long to destroy your land and kill your animals. And that's just stupid. 
<laughs> so if you're a farmer and you want to farm for any length of time, you have to learn to make yourself a student of the land and a student of the animals. You have to learn how to work with them. And so however we want to talk about dominion, we can get into all the grammatics about, you know, how does the words, do the words in Hebrew, you know, resonate in different passages. And, you know, there's monarchical resonances and all sorts of things. But from any sort of lived experience perspective, dominion cannot ever mean exploitation or abuse because it's bad theologically to say that, and it's certainly bad from any sort of livelihood perspective to do that. Now that raises the next question about urban life. And you know, as Mark said, I mean, the future is urban. You know, not too long down the road, 75% of all people on earth will be living in cities. And the question then is not, you know, do we just say agrarianism is done? No, we ask what kind of cities are we gonna have? Right now, we know that many of these mega cities, one third of the occupants will be living in slums. And, and this, is not, this is not a solution. Uh, so we have to figure out, do we wanna redesign our cities? Do we wanna think differently about cities? Because cities have never been just one thing, right? In many cultures, cities have all sorts of agrarian elements built into them. And we see this even today with, you know, the great interest in urban agriculture, which is a very exciting development. And urban designers are asking all sorts of questions about how can we do energy differently? How can we do water differently? How can we do food differently in our cities? Because we know that's where people are going to be. And the real job, I think, is how to bring an agrarian set of concerns and responsibilities into the imaginations of urban people so that they know how to, through their voting and their shopping, do the sorts of things that promote land health and the health of communities of people at the same time. And I know people say, how do you create an agrarian imagination in urban people? Well, it's no different than how we created an industrial imagination in urban people. I don't know any urban friends who are industrialists, but we've all imbibed the industrial logic. And so it's a question about how do we learn to educate people from a very early age on to understand how their food, their energy, their clothing, their housing, all the things that we need to live come from land, from water, and these are vulnerable. They're not to be taken for granted. And so even if you're not living on a farm, you're not living in an orchard, you're still be able, being able to advocate through your citizenry and through your consumer habits, ways that will protect both of these. Incredible answers there, thank you so much. Um, just a, a couple of quick questions just to break up the uh, really rich, wonderful answers while my brain catches up with everything you said. Um, uh, a quick question here um, for Mark. How many days do you spend on the road for walking a year and do you calculate it? Uh, yeah, I could calculate it. It's, uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I probably, there's probably about two, maybe three days a year that I don't walk at least five miles. Um, uh, so I, I usually, one of my, my, um, delicious joys for which if there's a purgatory, I'll have to do several extra millennia is when my colleagues show up all bleary eyed for morning prayer, I arrive bright eyed and bushy eyed, having done at least three to four miles with my, my two dogs. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm a, I'm a mad walker. So, um, <laughs> So I, I walk five to seven miles every day, uh, usually do a, a good 12 to 15 mile walk once a week. And then once a year, we'll do a proper trek of uh, over a, a week or two. This year, it's gonna be from Siena to Florence. Um, so I'll miss your conference, uh, uh, John, but uh, I'll think of you as I'm approaching Florence. No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that is, that is amazing. Um, my dog definitely doesn't get three miles before morning prayer. Um, I'm, yeah, you make me want to do better. Uh, John, I think you had a quick question as well. Yeah, just because um, we've got a, quite a few people who are doing this potting shed training as well for um, kind of these small growing spaces attached to churches or allotments in different, a number of different ways. I think both of you have kind of in some ways linked together what I'm hearing is the the small. So, uh, Mark, you've drawn out this um, kind of inhabiting a space by taking just literally a step in front of another, quite a small thing. Um, and then, uh, Norman, you've mentioned quite 
quite a few about the the injustice of um, having small landholders uh, being taken away. So I guess my, my question is this, we had, uh, Lucy and I were in a meeting and uh, someone was trying to figure out what we were about as Hazelnut. And she said, and she wasn't trying to be offensive, but she said, well, a community garden's not gonna change the world, is it? And um, I've, I was, I've kind of been shocked by that because actually in my mind, I really believe that it will. But I wonder if the two of you could speak to the power of the the small initiatives, the 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 person growing a tomato plant for the first time, uh, getting their hands in the soil, taking a risk, trying to assume that something they've not done before, even a, a church using a piece of land that's just, you know, just had daffodils on it, but now it can be productive. What's the power of that for communities? Well, I mean, I think, I think one thing that I want to stress that's so important for people to know who are new to this whole way of working is that growing food is not simple. <laughs> it is hard. You need to know so much, which is why you need to start small. And I think you need to also stay small in certain respects. And the answer to that is, is a little bit more indirect, but I think it can make some sense. I believe that it's only love that will save the world only love and the truth of love is you can't love everybody you can't love every place love has to put its energy in in hands reach if you want to put it that way i'm always suspicious of somebody who says i love thousands of people you can't possibly love thousands of people because it takes time to know what you love it takes time being in the presence of what you love where you love whom you love and that means you necessarily have to acknowledge that love works within limits, even though love is boundless. And so from an agricultural or gardening point of view, if you are a farmer and you think that you can farm thousands of acres and show the kind of love and attention that you could give to one acre, you're fooling yourself and you're gonna end up doing things that destroy the land. So the virtue of smallness is that it gives the place for your love to actually grow deeply and not stay superficial or just emotive. So that's something that's really important. And when you take care of a small place, a small garden, and you show your love for it, it will be beautiful in a way that a big place will likely not be. And so giving that attention to small places is so important. And the boundlessness of love can emerge when more and more people capture the meaning and the significance of trying to do love on this sort of a scale. And that's how the world changes, not by somebody saying, I'm going to love everybody by doing everything all at once, because that's impossible. Yeah, I, I would agree. The only thing I would add to that, um, and uh, and I'll, I'll I'll risk being like the, the devil and quoting scripture out of context, but we 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 need not worry about uh, changing the world because our our Savior is doing that, um, and and has done that. The the, the strife is over. The the victory is won, uh, and so all we need to worry about doing is is that loving business. Uh, loving, loving God and loving our neighbor, uh, and that I think Norman and my book uh, would would contend or do contend that that involves also loving the places where we encounter uh, God with our neighbors, uh, the places where we live, and if we're doing that, however small it is. We know, as Paul assures us at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor, your work, your love is not in vain. And we can take confidence in that. Can I, can I just uh, add one other little gloss on scripture here since we're in that sort of the mode? Sort of. <laughs> you know, in, in 1 John, it says you... If you have people who say they love God, but don't love their neighbors, they're lying. Can we just expand that one more step, which I think would be in direct consonance with the scripture itself. But what if we were to start to realize that you can't say you love God if you don't love your neighbor, if you don't love your neighbor's neighborhood. 
You can't love your neighbor if you don't love their neighborhood. It's impossible. Because if you don't love the neighborhood, the neighborhood becomes a place of suffering and pain and injustice. It's just that simple. And we're the ones that have to be taught this. And so I would want to say, let's expand First John. Because the spirit, I think, of the gospel is, is this way. That we need to see that the love of God, neighbor, and neighborhood have to go together. And if you don't love neighborhood as sort of the foundation, you can't really be loving neighbor or God. Fantastic. Um, we have time for one more question. There are so many questions in the chat. And if you haven't been looking through the chat um, during this, I mean, you probably haven't had time. There's been so much wonderful stuff to digest. Um, that please do have a quick look at the end of this. There's some really insightful comments and questions. Um, and I think most of them have been touched on now. Um, but just to wrap up with a final question, um, how does the structure of prayer uh, in some way relate to this matter? So how, how does the, the underpinning of prayer and these practices, your prayer life, personal, corporate liturgy, how does prayer underpin this? Mm. I love the question. It's a great question. And I think what I want to do is, is, is I want to talk about what I would say is sort of the foundation of prayer rather than getting into the various forms of prayer, of which there are many, as you all know. But when Paul says, pray without ceasing, I've wondered a long time, what could that possibly mean? Because you know, we, got, we got stuff to do. <laughs> so what does pray without ceasing mean? And I think what, what pray without ceasing finally means is, is it, it it's about cultivating in you the space through which the love of God can move. It's not creating a space. The space is already there. Because you are, as I said earlier, as a creature beloved by God, the actual embodied manifestation of the presence of that love in you and along with all the other people. So it's learning, as the psalmist would say, how to have a pure heart understanding the heart to be that organ within the person that is the seat of motivation, activity, and desire. So how do we clean out the rubbish that prevents the love of God from being activated fully or maximally in our lives? And if we were to do that, I think what would happen is we would be open to the world to sense its beauty, but also its pain. We would be open to others to sense their beauty and their pain. And we would be open to ourselves to sense our own beauty and our pain so that we could then figure out how to be a nurturing presence in a world that's always already nurturing us. That's a short answer. So I'll, I'll answer that with a, a short story from my background and, and sort of what led indirectly to this book and led to all sorts of things. But when I was a... Um, a, a priest in Western North Carolina. I started having young adults coming to me for spiritual direction. They were really interested uh, in, in exploring and developing a contemplative prayer life. And I found with most of them, I couldn't get anywhere with them. And, and though they would come up with many different ways of explaining why they found contemplative prayer difficult, ultimately it all came back to, they found it rather boring. Uh, and, and this really struck me because one of them, uh, as we began to explore her life a bit more, she was a very talented artist, but she never did art anymore. She was too busy um, um, on the internet uh, doing social media. Uh, another guy lived within a stone's throw of Pisgah National Forest and some of those beautiful landscape you can find anywhere. Um, he never went out to, to, uh, to, to sit in it or be with her or walk in it because he was too busy playing video games all the time. Um, and that is one of the things that began to get me to uh, explore what has really been my passion of the past 13 years and led to my move to the UK. Uh, and that is, what do we mean by delight? What does it mean to enjoy the other for its own sake? Uh, and, and I think that enjoyment of God for his own sake is one of the things that's very difficult for us to do. Always has been. That's part of what it means to be fallen. 
but I think it's especially hard for us to do in this day and age where we rush around, where we, we don't stop and be still and be attentive and to listen. Uh, and I think the sacred life that Norman speaks of, and especially um, where Norman speaks about craftsmanship and the focus of craftsmanship and the love that's required in craftsmanship. And then in, in my writings about walking and, and the moving slowly through landscape. I mean, others may be different, but I find even cycling through landscape is, is, is too quick. You gotta move slowly through it and do it repeatedly um, to really get to know that landscape. This begins to develop the kind of habits that then allow one to make all of one's life a prayer. Uh, and it's, it could be a kind of smarmy thing to do, to say, oh, you just, everything you do should be prayerful, should be a prayer, you know, that, and then you probably start singing George Herbert. But, but it's a difficult thing to do if you are trained, as we are all trained today, to be constantly distracted, constantly looking for something that stimulates us, constantly on, on the move. Uh, I'm reminded here of yesterday, and perhaps this is a metaphor for prayer. Um, one of my two dogs, Humphrey, is completely bonkers. Uh, all of you will know probably that spaniels by their nature are bonkers. Well, we have discovered that if you take a Springer Spaniel and you mix it with a Cocker Spaniel, you don't get twice the madness, you get exponential madness. Uh, and, and Humphrey yesterday morning had lost his ball. The ball was in fact three inches in front of his face, but he wouldn't stop to just look. He was chasing around like mad all around this ball and he never could find it. Um, which actually worked well because I didn't have to take it off him as we were getting home. But many, we are in many ways like that with prayer. Prayer is right there. The prayerful life is right there, three inches in front of our face. But the habits we have, the screen time we spend, uh, the, the busy lives we, we, we live, the, the, the deep training, as I said, that life gives us in constantly needing to be distracted means that we don't stop. And notice, to be scriptural about it, God's still small voice right there. Uh, and I know from my own experience that one of the best things I ever did for developing a, a much healthier, much stronger prayer life was just that simple action of putting one foot in front of the other uh, and learning to slow down for long periods of time. Such beautiful answers there. Thank you so, so much. Um, John, can I pass over to you to, to round us up? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lucy. And a huge thank you, um, Norman and Mark. It was just wonderful and so much to think about. Again, this is there. You don't have, you can come back and view this on YouTube. It'll be up tomorrow and I'll share it out on social media as well. But you shouldn't be on social media. You should be doing a five mile walk. <laughs> but if you happen to be on there, you can see it on there. Um, uh, just we we are at time, but I, I just want to give Mark just uh, just a little thirty seconds. You've got a conference you're running. Can you give it a quick plug, and we'll do an email out um, with the link as well when we're done. But I just think people would want to hear about it because it yeah. sounds fascinating. Oh yeah, thanks. So uh, as as John mentioned, I'm uh, the director founder of what's called Convivium. The tagline is "Living Well with God, Creation, and Each Other." Uh, and we have, at long last, after two years of postponement, our second Convivium Conference, which is entitled Inhabiting Memories and Landscapes, a cross-disciplinary engagement with Wendell Berry. Uh, and it's going to be here at um, Brecon Cathedral. Uh, Norman is our, our keynote speaker. Um, and uh, we have some just amazing papers that have been uh, submitted. It's gonna be a really interesting, I think, take. Uh, and it won't just be papers and, and good Welsh food, um, but there'll also be the opportunity to go on a really well thought through walk of a of an ancient local hamlet by a fellow who knows every square inch of that of that hamlet. And it just resonates so much, not only with convivium, 
but also many things that we talked about this evening. So, so uh, I'm sure John will share the, uh, the details for uh, how you can book for that uh, and, and do come. It should be a good time. Absolutely. Um, I will share that, that link out for sure. And let me just stop recording now.